Good morning, live spring. It is so great to be with you as always. And this morning, I want to begin with reading our passage. And as is becoming my custom in this series, I'm going to steal a few verses from outside of the passage that I've been given this morning. My passage is Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, but I'm going to read from verse 15 to verse 33. So why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever uh, hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, my main passage this morning could seem like it's the first of three separate sections. I'm sure if you look in your Bibles, there will be a heading at verse 22 of chapter 5 saying something about marriages, wives and husbands. And then if you look ahead to chapter 6, it says something like children and parents. And if you move forward again to verse 5 of chapter 6, it will say something around slaves and masters. It could look like these things stand alone as separate items or topics that Paul is addressing. Or it could look like there is some kind of link, maybe around family life, husbands, wives, mums, dads, kids and parents, looking at how we operate in the home and then slaves and masters, at how we operate at work, which I think we would all just consider to be elements of basic family life together. And whilst I think that that is true, I think there is something far more central to each of those sections of scripture. And it all hangs off of one foundational verse which carries this, this single central theme. And the meaning I think that Paul is trying to convey here. And that verse is verse 21. And in the King James Version it says, Submitting to one another in the fear of of Christ. And I believe that this is the central theme for all of these other sections of scripture and are simply examples of this central theme of submitting one to another in the fear of Christ. And the illustrations that follow are not intended to be an exhaustive list but a list of examples of how submitting to one another in the fear of Christ might look. Notice too, it doesn't say submit yourselves to one another, but submitting yourselves one to another. Submitting is one of those continuous words and it means to put under. It's active. It's a choice. It's an action of humility. 
It's an act of your will. It's not an act of surrender to someone more powerful, important or dominant than you. It's not an act of servitude, but of willing service and humility to others in the fear of Christ. Paul, the author of this letter, says something almost identical in his letter to the Philippian church in Philippians 2 and verse 3, where he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. In humility, submitting yourselves one to another, counting others more significant than yourself in the fear of Christ. Willingly sacrificing your own ambitions for Jesus' ambitions for his church, the church that he died for and the church he calls you to lay your life down for, to sacrifice your own pride for, to give up your own selfish ambitions and desires for the good of. When you joined Lifespring, what did you hope for? Somewhere where you could be looked after? Or somewhere where you would sacrifice your needs for the needs of others? Was it somewhere you hoped your gifts and talents would be used for your benefit and pleasure? Or was it somewhere where you thought you would lay aside your personal ambitions and mission in your life for the good of the mission for the life of the whole? Today, if you were to enlist in the army, you would do so of your own free will. There is no national service or impending war that demands a compulsory draft. And so to join the army today, you would do so of your own free will. But once in the army, you then surrender your own ambition. You release your own idea of how things should be done and you relinquish your personal rights by continually submitting, not to one another, but to your commanding officers and the organisation as a whole and its mission, its tactics and its deployment methodology. Surrendering your rights, laying aside your own status seems pretty draconian in this day and age. But in the service of the Queen, that is exactly what our armed forces do. And that is exactly what Paul is getting at here. It's what um, seeps through the verses that we're reflecting on today and the others that follow. How we are to surrender our rights, lay aside our own status and personal ambition and tactics in service, not of the Queen, but of the King, of King Jesus. And Paul is saying that we are to submit ourselves to his mission to seek and save the lost. We are to submit to his deployment methodology of discipleship where as his church, each one of us is continually and willingly submitting one to another. The verses today regarding husbands and wives that have children and parents next week and employees and employers the following week are simply the outworking of that mutual submission in the home, in the family and at work basically explaining what this kind of submission looks like in everyday life. Now, at one level, I have no idea what you're thinking, but I wonder if maybe on the other hand, I probably do. When I read this and when I truly understood it, my first thought was how? I mean, I know Paul gives the example of marriage, family and work, and they seem to be like great things to aim at or to aspire towards. But in real life, every day, it honestly seems like an impossible bar to reach. I mean, Hazel is lovely and all, and I love her with all my heart. But as Christ loves the church, laying his life down, laying aside his majesty, giving up his rights, his status and his life even for the church. Loving Hazel like that? What about my rights to be right all the time? What about my opinion? What about what I want out of this relationship? I have to submit all of that to just loving Hazel? How? I mean, obviously, it's much easier for Hazel to respect and submit to me as the church does to Jesus because I'm already so much like Jesus. What, you don't believe me? Look, I have a beard like Jesus and whilst I have drawn the line at wearing sandals, I think I'm getting there, maybe. But seriously, 
And just to be clear, I am joking. <laughs> the truth be told, Hazel is the one that is most like Jesus and is a constant provocation to me in that regard. But this, this concept of each of us sacrificing our own rights, humbling ourselves by continually submitting ourselves one to another out of a holy fear in Christ is a tall order. And if we're honest with ourselves, it seems impossible. How can we really live like that? How many arguments have you had with your boss, with your kids, with your parents, with your spouse, because you believed your way was the right way? Because you wanted something or you wanted something done a particular way, your way, of course, and you were willing to argue and fight or even sulk to get it. How many times did you feel it was just not fair because you felt some other employee was getting a better deal than you? Maybe because your sibling got a better outcome than you or because your spouse does not seem as loving or as godly or as good as some of the other husbands or wives in the church. How many times have you thought or worse said, if only you were more like them? There are two reasons in my mind that it's impossible to live out this principle that Paul is giving us in this passage. At least two. Firstly, because we find it really hard to think, treat and behave as if others are more significant than us because we are all conditioned to believe that I have rights and that I'm entitled to many things. We are an entitled generation. And secondly, and more seriously, because we don't really fear God. We understand God is Father, and yet we forget that he is still God Almighty. He is Holy Father, God, God Almighty, not God Almighty. He is God the Father who loves us, who's sent his own son to die for us so that we might be adopted as sons and daughters. He is a wonderful father, but he is a holy father. The same holy father God who struck down Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. The same holy God who made the ground swallow up those who stole from him. The same holy God who, when Uzziah reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant, died. This fear of God, or as Paul puts it, in the fear of Christ, is not an anxious fear of unpredictability, uncertain behaviours or unjust outcomes, but a holy fear of a holy, loving God who is just and righteous and always true to himself. And as such, we need to bow the knee of our own will, ambitions, pride and entitlement and say, not my will be done, but yours. He has chosen us, saved us, redeemed us, gifted us, grafted us into his church. And it is the love of a father. But he has also enlisted us in his army. He's given us our corporate orders, a mandate to be a community of disciple makers. Disciples who make disciples, who seek and save the lost by humbling ourselves in genuine love, which is demonstrated by continually and authentically submitting to one another. In our own strength, this is an impossible task. But with God, all things are possible. And this impossible task to which we have been called is made possible by God himself. And the answer is in a few verses prior to verse 21, which was why I read more than I was given. Let's remind ourselves again. Ephesians 5 verse 15. Look Carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence or in fear of Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. That is the answer here. 
And we too easily think that being filled with the Spirit is something we need so we can have the gift of tongues, so we can intimately communicate with Father God and so we can have something that we can use to build up our inner selves. And, and that's true. But there's more to it than just that. There is more to it than just being able to prophesy or have words of knowledge or incredible faith or perform miracles or see the sick healed or even the dead raised. Yes, being filled or baptised in the Spirit really does empower us for all of those things and it's good to seek the gifts of the Spirit. But as Paul tells the church in Corinth, even if I have all those things but I don't have genuine, submissive love in the Holy Spirit, what's the point? Let's remind ourselves of that passage in 1 Corinthians verse 13, beginning at verse 1, I'm sure you will have heard this read out at many weddings. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. Love never ends. Greater love has no man than this, Jesus said that someone lay his life down for a friend. He also said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples and that you're my church if you have this kind of love for one another. Yes, we need to be filled with the Spirit to be on mission to achieve the objective Jesus has given us to seek and save the lost and make disciples but we also need to be filled with the Spirit to achieve this humanly impossible command to be continually submitting one to another, to continually prefer and defer to one another. For wives to submit to their own husbands, for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and for all of us to obey and submit to leadership that God has placed over us just as the church submits to Christ. Don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit, submitting one to another in the holy fear of Christ. We need to be filled with the Spirit to be able to continually be submitting one to another. We need to be full of the Spirit to have marriages that reflect Jesus, families that look like His, everyday lives that imitate Jesus and churches where we're submitted to one another, submitted to leadership and genuinely submitted to Jesus. For that, we need supernatural Holy Spirit fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. This is what Paul is driving at here. Can you imagine a marriage where both husband and wife are living full of Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control? Not learned skills, but genuine Holy Spirit fruit flowing from your inner being. How easy would it be to submit to one another if those others were constantly expressing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control towards you? Wives, how easy would it be to submit to a husband as you should to the Lord when he is laying his life down for you as Christ did for the church, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in the Holy Spirit. Husbands, how easy would it be to love your wife as Christ loved the church, giving up your rights for her when she is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in the Holy Spirit. This kind of marriage is only possible for the Christian. 
And it's only possible for the Christian who is full of the Spirit. Else it's merely a legalistic obligation, full of tasks to perform, rules to follow, appearances to keep up and standards to be measured and criticised by. Without being full of the Holy Spirit, these things are just a duty. But for us, if we are filled with the Spirit, that duty can become a delight. It can become a joy, something in which you find deep satisfaction, fulfilment and life. Just want to remind you that the passage about husbands is to husbands. It's not to wives. And what I mean by that is that the passage for husbands is so husbands can hold a mirror to themselves and listen to what the Holy Spirit is revealing to them in order that they, as husbands, can act. The passage about husbands is not for wives to hold up and demand that they be treated better. It's not a stick to beat your husband with, but an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to reveal to him how to be more like Jesus. I've already told you that Hazel is a constant provocation to me to be more like Jesus. Why? Because she is a wife full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in the Holy Spirit. Is she perfect? No. But I know the way she submits to me, loves me and respects me is not something she could do in her own strength because even though I joked earlier, I still have some way to go to be like Jesus. And likewise, husbands, instead of demanding respect and submission and using these verses about wives as your theological basis to insist on certain behaviours, why not hold the verses about loving your wife as a mirror to your own soul? Asking yourself, as she looks at how you conduct yourself, as your kids observe you treating her and as onlookers observe your family, do they see a man doing the best he can with what he has? Or do they see a man full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in the Holy Spirit? How we live as husbands and wives, as nuclear families and as a church family express something of a kingdom dynamic. Paul calls it a profound mystery that our marriages and I think indeed our families, our work and our church life are a picture to the world of what the relationship between Jesus and the church looks like. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Does your marriage reflect the submission of the church to Christ? Does it demonstrate the way Christ looks to love, to raise and release the church? Is your marriage um, to, are you both in your marriage loving each other, cherishing each other, nourishing each other, just as Christ does the church? Now, I know it specifically says that husbands are to do that, but I don't think that excludes wives from that action any more than I think Paul's exhortation to husbands to love their wives excludes the wives from loving husbands. I think Paul's not presenting an exhaustive list of what husbands and wives should do, but he is highlighting and prioritising things that I think are possibly weaknesses or vulnerable tendencies in each. Wives could be more likely to be unsubmissive and disrespectful, while husbands may tend towards being unloving, disconnected, cold, unemotional, unemotional and businesslike. And Paul is merely emphasising to husbands that this expression of Jesus and the church is most readily seen by the world when you really love your wife with a love that is a fruit of the spirit. And that wives, when you respect and submit to your husbands in a correct Holy Spirit inspired way, you demonstrate the otherworldness of life in the spirit. As I say, these are not actions restricted to one party or the other, but both. But certain things being specifically emphasised to each. Wives, we are told that they should submit to their husbands. But in verse 21, it says that we are to submit one to another. And so husbands are to be mutually submitted to their wives too. 
But Paul is saying there is a special grace on husbands as the head of the home, just as Jesus is the head of the church. And that's true in the family with children and parents. There's a mutual submission in families, but a special grace on parents to lead. The same is true in everyday life at work with employees and employers, teachers and students, as we'll see in the coming weeks. It's true of leaders and churches where there's a special grace for elders to lead. It's true that eldership teams work in team but there's a special grace for someone to lead that team but that doesn't mean that we're not a team or that we're unequal or anyone is less valued it doesn't mean that we don't discuss things disagree or talk things out not at all but it does mean that there is love and respect and submission and a mutual expression of love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control in the Holy Spirit to work these things out in relationship. And this passage, particularly verse 21, has been misused out of context over the years to try and force unity around theological error. And many uh, would say that we shouldn't disagree, but we should just simply submit one to another in the fear of Christ. They believe wrongly that disagreement signals disunity and lack of submission. Their premise being that unity trumps theological truth, but that's nonsense and totally out of context in this verse. Paul is writing to churches that have gathered in agreement on the fundamentals of doctrine or they wouldn't be there. The foundations of theological truth have clearly been established and it is within that context that Paul says submit to one another in the fear of Christ. This is not some stupid call to unity where everyone's opinion is equally valid, where everyone's interpretation of scripture is equally correct. That would be ridiculous. And in fact, it would call other New Testament scriptures into question. Paul, for example, called out the apostle Peter when he was in doctrinal er error over not eating with the uncircumcised believers. And if this verse, submit yourself one to another, meant Paul had to submit to Peter whatever the issue, then he would have been quite wrong to call out Peter's error. However, this verse is not talking about the fundamentals of doctrine itself, but how that agreed and fundamental doctrine is worked out in the power of the spirit and in submission one to another. Peter's error was an error of fundamental doctrine. We know that there is no Jew or Gentile. We know that we are now one new man in Christ. We've read it right here in Ephesians through this series. And so Paul was right to call Peter out. This verse and indeed the passages that follow is all about how we and as men and women, and boys and girls full of the spirit live out the doctrine and theology that we all agree on. So were you to sit in on our elders meeting sometimes, you would see that they are quite lively, that they can be passionate and pretty expressive at times too. But we are mutually submitted in the fear of Christ to one another. And that means we can still prefer and defer to one another. We can still consider each other better than ourselves. We can love and protect and respect each other even when we don't agree. We're not perfect in that, we still get it wrong, but we are equally quick to forgive and move on out of reverence for Jesus. And that, as Paul says, should be reflected in our marriages as well, it should be reflected in our families as well, and that kind of thing should be reflected in the church as well. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one to another in fear of Christ. Now, I'm not going to make a call for a response this morning because I don't feel that the things that I've spoken about are 
I just think that's so relational that a disconnected offer of prayer is not what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I do think that if you feel convicted, if you feel like the Holy Spirit has revealed some stuff to you this morning, then I want to invite you to cooperate with him and engage with that. Decide right now to speak to your spouse right after this live stream and explain what Holy Spirit has shown you about you. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is going to show you what's wrong with your spouse. So we're not even going to go there or do that. But share what the Holy Spirit has said to you about you. Repent to God if needed. Repent to them if needed. Pray together. Agree together to mutually submit one to another. Ask for Holy Spirit fruit to come and fill your lives and marriage. Now, for some, that may be too difficult right now and you may need some pastoral help or even some professional help. And so I'd encourage you both together to speak to your life group leaders who will be able to help you or point you to someone who can. Equally, it may be that Holy Spirit has been speaking to you through this about submission to one another in a different area of your life at LifeSpring. Maybe he's been speaking about laying your life down in submission. And again, I would encourage you, chat to your life group leaders, chat in your small group. But right now, before I end, let's pray. Pray together and ask Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to help us. Heavenly Father, we need you. I need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you. We need you to come and fill us afresh. Fill us now. Come, Holy Spirit. I invite you to, to come right now. Come and, and meet with us. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us. Fill us with your, your power. Fill us with your gifts. Fill us with your joy. But, oh, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you fill us with that love that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that goodness, that faithfulness, that gentleness and that self-control that only comes from you. Lord, because this before us seems too big a mountain to climb, but we know with you all things are possible. And we know that with the Holy Spirit you have made a way. And so I ask you, meet with each of us now. Help us, I pray. Help us be individuals, families, uh, husbands and wives and a church that truly reflect Jesus and the way the church submits to him. Oh God, help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.